This talk is about the fundamental principles involved in choosing psychotropic medications to treat mental illness. In this talk, I'll outline seven principles that I consider to be universal for making decisions about medication treatment for most psychiatric illnesses and for most types of psychotropic medication. This talk draws significantly from my personal experience, and different experts may have different views on the topic. I'll outline each of the seven principles in order of importance. The first principle involves the safety profile of medications. Remember, as a doctor, one of your fundamental obligations is to do no harm. As such, you should not recommend a medication where the potential harm outweighs the potential benefit. Specific factors to consider here are the medication's risk of serious or irreversible side effects such as organ failure, the presence of comorbid medical illness that could increase the risk of serious side effects, or drug-drug interactions between the psychotropic and any other medications the patient may already be taking. Second, consider the patient's preferences. This is the most nuanced principle to master and involves taking into account the patient's beliefs and opinions regarding medication and mental illness, which could be based on the patient's culture, upbringing, treatment history, or other factors. Sometimes these beliefs may be illogical or not based on scientific fact or majority opinion. However, even in these cases, you need to do your best to understand them and take them into account in your clinical decision making. There are two major reasons why this is important. First is the expectancy effect which essentially means that if someone believes strongly that a treatment is going to help them, it is more likely to help them. Second is the concept of the therapeutic alliance and how this alliance impacts treatment adherence. In general, a person is more likely to listen to their doctor and adhere to the treatment they recommend if the person feels that they are being listened to, understood, and cared for. The simple takeaway from this principle is that if you are trying to decide between two different medication options that are approximately the same in terms of safety and effectiveness, and the patient has a preference between one or the other, then choose the medication that the patient prefers. Third, consider the patient's prior trials of medications. It is important to know what medications the patient has previously tried, including how effective it was, how well it was tolerated in terms of side effects, the highest dose that was tried, and the longest duration that was tried. Here, it is important to know the concept of an adequate trial. An adequate trial refers to taking a medication consistently as prescribed for an adequate duration and at an adequate dose. Specifically, the highest dose of the medication that the patient is able to tolerate and is approved by the FDA, also known as the maximum tolerated dose. For completeness sake, a related concept is the minimum effective dose, which is the lowest dose of medication necessary to achieve the intended therapeutic effect or goal. In general, you should avoid using higher doses than the minimum effective dose to limit adverse effects. Fourth, consider the ease of use. This involves the dosing schedule, or how often the medication needs to be administered in a day, and the administration route, that is, whether it is taken by mouth, injection, a skin patch, or another method. For example, a once-per-day medication is easier to use than a twice-per-day medication, and an oral medication is easier to use than an injection medication. Fifth, Consider side effects. In general, a medication with fewer or easier to tolerate side effects is going to be easier to adhere to than one with worse side effects. Consider both the common side effects, but also the side effects that may occur only rarely, but are potentially serious. For example, organ failure, heart arrhythmias, or seizures. Sixth, consider secondary benefits. If possible, choose a medication that targets multiple symptoms or accomplishes multiple goals. For example, if the patient wants to treat both their depression and their chronic pain, consider using an antidepressant that targets both. Finally, consider the drug cost. This is perhaps an overgeneralization, but in most cases, newer medications for mental health problems, which are still on patent and expensive, are no more effective than older medications that were developed many years ago, for which there are cheap generic options available and are more often covered by insurance plans. If you do need to use a more expensive medication, then be aware that there may be financial assistance programs available for specific medications. That's the end of this talk. I hope this provides a useful framework for thinking about choosing psychotropic medications. Thank you.